Good evening, everyone. Uh, good to see you here. Uh, we've got a topic tonight that I think is quite relevant uh, to all of us. If you have a uh, smartphone at all, I'm sure it will be relevant to you. Um, if you live in this society and not perhaps in a uh, monastery, again, this, uh, this topic is going to be relevant to all of us. And that is, can I glorify God in my entertainment or a biblical view of entertainment? So with that, let's pray and let's seek the Lord's wisdom as we discuss this topic. Uh, Lord, we praise you for every good gift of life. Lord, you give us all things to enjoy. Uh, you bestow upon us the ability to work, uh, the ability to exert our efforts, use our gifts, enjoy the gifts of others. Uh, Lord, you give us minds to discern right and wrong. You give us wor the word of God to guide us in the truth and help us to walk in a manner that is worthy of Christ. Lord, we want to be people who honor you in every way. We want to honor you with our thoughts, our words, things that we see, things that we do. And Lord, we know that this world opposes you and we know that we are living in it. Uh, but Father, we, at the same time, we know we are redeemed and we have the ability to uh, influence and be influenced by the word of God. So guide us, we do pray, and bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Entertainment. I think it's one thing that, to say that we are in an entertainment-saturated world. Never before have we been more entertained than we have been now. As I mentioned, if you have a smartphone uh, no doubt you've looked at it, even probably today, uh, for some sort of entertainment. I think Facebook took a survey and it was noted that users of Facebook have a desire to look at Facebook every 31 seconds. And that seems a bit extreme to me, but <laughs> maybe that's true. And primarily, uh, well, maybe to look at what other people are doing, but also for the entertainment of it. There's entertainment found on Facebook. There is entertainment found in our pocket and the question is, how do we, as Christians, live in this entertainment-saturated world while not taking this world-denying legalism of saying there should be no entertainment in the Christian life? You know, Christians are just meant to be bound to the Word of God, read the Word of God, and, uh, and go to your work, do that, and then ultimately go home, pray, go to bed. Uh, nor do we want to be the indulgent, entertainment indulgent people of just say, simply saying, look, you know, we are saved by grace. We can basically take on whatever we want. And surely it doesn't influence us. Like, I mean, I'm mature now. Um, so what, how do we deal with this issue of entertainment in the Christian life? I'm going to look at it from three perspectives. First of all, we're going to look at the blessing of entertainment. We're going to look and see that Entertainment is a blessing given by God for our good use. The second is looking at the dangers of entertainment. Many of those you would know, but we're going to assess those from the Word of God. And the third aspect is just looking at principles that help guide us when we come to uh, view, participate in entertainment, whatever that looks like. And so they'll all be up here. So we're going to look at the blessing the dangers, and some principles to help, us guide, help guide us as we think of entertainment and potentially as parents as we seek to guide our children in what entertainment they should be watching. So the first point is, let's look at the blessing of entertainment. The concept, and we'll pull back for a moment, the concept of rest, of rest for the people of God is a motif that weaves its way through scripture. We know that uh, the world was created or the, the universe, uh, God's creation took place over six days. On the seventh day, it says God rested. God rested on the seventh day. We find that in the law given by, to Moses in the fourth commandment, it says you should keep the Sabbath day holy by keeping it as a day of rest. Six days you should work the Seventh day, you are to rest on the seventh day. We find that the disobedient Jews, as Andrew told us this morning, did not enter into the promised land, which was called the rest, 
because they're disobedience. And we find that Joshua, even after entering the promised land, said that this is actually not our ultimate rest. Our ultimate rest will come through the line of David, who will be Christ. And then we find in the New Testament that Christ is our ultimate rest. Christ is our ultimate rest who has redeemed us and brought him to brought us to himself. But we notice not only is this motive of rest uh, going through the scriptures and ending in Christ, but at the same time, rest seems to be bound in the creative order. We are people who are to rest. We are not to constantly work 24-7. And I think that is seen in the, uh, the fact that God rested on the seventh day, not that God needed to rest, but just simply to uh, lead by example, to ultimately proclaim Christ or symbol of Christ's rest, but to give us this aspect of rest. We find that the land was to be rested uh, in Israel. We, have find, we find that the seventh day was a day of rest. And I don't think, again, that's just simply pointing to Christ. I think it is. But God, in his uh, grace and mercy, has given us rest in our labors. But notice that it is rest from our labors. This is not laziness. This is not simply saying that I uh, enjoy this time of rest or laziness. It is the result of good work. You work hard six days and you rest on the seventh. You work hard through the day, you rest at night. The whole point is that God gives us by his grace a, a time of resting, a time to recuperate, a time of refreshment. He provides this to us. And then couple with this, couple this with the concept of entertainment. Entertainment in the Latin root has the idea of holding together. It is seen as a means of giving some sort of rest to one's life to hold it together, to ease the tension, to ease the burden, to provide rest in giving us some aspect of outlet, of joy, of enjoyment. So we have this work time, we have this rest time, and I believe that the entertainment is a common grace God gives to all of us to actually enjoy, to find our rest. Where do we see this? I'll firstly quote the uh, reformer Martin Luther. He says, musical performance is principal among the entertainment that God has graciously given us to enjoy in this life. So Martin Luther saw that the musical performance was a time of entertainment that he could enjoy. And I think of the nature of God. You know, God could have created this wor world in a very bland way. Do we, I don't know if we need colour uh, for this world to operate. I don't think we do. Um, I don't know if we need such brilliance of sunsets, of, uh, of waterfalls, of rain and, and beautiful sunshine. In the created order, we see this symphony of, if you will, something we can enjoy and be entertained by. I only have to walk outside and I'm very entertained by the cockatoos in the tree going crazy and, and doing all acrobats, acrobatic feats. There is an aspect of I'm enjoying what God has provided. But then we look in the scriptures and in many ways we see entertainment or the, use, the, the creative aspect of entertainment in play. Now, whether this is a good thing or, or a bad thing, the descendant of Cain, uh, Jubal, uh, it says in Genesis 4.21, he was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. Now, I'm sure he's just not playing it to himself. I'm sure he's playing it to his family and he's the father of those things and therefore he would be bringing those things to everyone else. And yes, for the enjoyment of all to see and the worship of God. King David, it says, played his harp. He played his harp while tending to his sheep. He was composing hymns and music. He provided the playing of the harp to give Saul some sort of rest so that he would soothe his spirit 
as David would play. There was soothing, there was entertainment in that. We notice that David danced before the ark. Uh, David is one who does enjoy giving entertainment to people and also enjoys uh, being entertained, most likely. Solomon, it says that he produced 105 songs. Uh, he, was, he, he was a poet, uh, he was a writer. Uh, in Ecclesiastes, he says that there is a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. Maybe a time to entertain and a time to be entertained. Uh, Paul, if we go to the New Testament, uh, was he an entertainer or did he enjoy entertainment? Well, I don't think there's any direct verse to say that um, enjoy entertainment for its rest purposes or for its enjoyment. But look at, Paul was in a culture that was just as much as Melbourne entertainment fixated, whether it's sports or, uh, or oratory displays. Uh, but he used, notice he used a lot of symbolism or a lot of themes taken from the Roman culture to bring to help us to understand the Christian life. He spoke of running a race. Uh, now, no doubt he would have seen many races run. There was an entertainment aspect to that. He's, he talked about boxing. Now, boxing is obviously designed for entertainment. He talks about wrestling. But notice when he says these things, uh, and there's Bible verses, but I won't just for the sake of time, uh, go into those. He talks about bringing these aspects of the culture as illustrations on how we are to live our Christian life. We are to run like a runner. We are to compete like a boxer or a wrestler. We are to be single-minded. We are to train. We are to be self-denying, persevering, enduring. But notice that it's through the aspects of cultural entertainment that he brings these illustrations into the Christian life. To say this is how the Christian life should operate. The watching, if watching of entertainment or participating in it was condemned by Paul, I don't think he would use such vivid illustrations in the culture to bring that to bear on the Christian life. I think God blesses we find all things to enjoy. First Timothy 6.17 God richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Now that's said in the, in the context of do not place your hope in riches for God, bless, God provides everything. He provides you everything but notice it's not just simply everything full stop. It's everything to enjoy. He provides everything to enjoy. And that goes... I believe, uh, with entertainment. However, and this takes us to the dangers, we are not naive to think that uh, we can just see that God's common grace comes upon this culture or this world and God uses, uh, God gives gifts to people to entertain us. We are not naive to think that uh, we should not be discerning and extremely wise with regards to the entertainment we watch and participate in. Uh, we find that at the very uh, commencement of when sin entered the world, so did corruption. So did corruption of all things. But we do know uh, that God, through Christ, has redeemed us, and that all things, while we are living in this sinful world, all things are not necessarily um, to be rejected as such. But so what are some of the dangers? And let's, let's look at four dangers, and then we're going to look at six principles to help govern our way through what we should watch, what we should participate in, and what we should, what we should view. So let's have a look at a number of dangers. And I've got a question after each one that you can assess your own life with. So the, the first is that entertainment can create a distraction. Entertainment can create distraction, and the question I'm sort of asking is, is my entertainment distracting me away from renewing my mind in God? I just want you to think that regarding the Christian life. The Christian life is like no other life on this earth. We are saved from the sinful, our sinful nature that delights in the things of this world, in the things of this age. 
And we now have our hope in heaven. We are born again in this world, but we're not taken out of the world. We have our hope in heaven, but we've got to stay in the world. Uh, We are to not be influenced, but we are to influence. So how do you navigate this whole process of living the Christian life with great joy and perseverance in a world that ultimately is against God? This is a challenge, to be salt and light in this world. And John 15, 19, Jesus says, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. It's not an easy life to be a Christian. We need great discernment and great wisdom. Praise God that we have the scriptures and the Holy Spirit to guide us and each other. But we are of the, we're in the world, but not of the world. So how do we, we, sorry, no, we've got to understand that being in the world means there is an onslaught against us with the world's thinking, with the world's desires. And by that, we can be distracted from what is the most important thing. I was reading this week an article regarding the dangers of entertainment. And it talked about how the entertainment of our day is becoming so sophisticated that it's, and you would know this, that it is becoming more rapid fire, right? So that if you're looking at a clip, the clip only only lasts, every little segment only lasts for a few seconds. And to move you on, it wants to keep moving you on. If you've ever um, been in the US and watched the Weather Channel, Fox News Weather Channel, I mean, it's captivating, this thing. They're telling the weather 24 hours a day. And I'm on the edge of my seat thinking, I've got to keep watching this. Like, (laughs) they are are geniuses with entertaining by the most menial things. But the whole point is that that by the the methodology of entertainment, it's training our minds to be distracted, to want this fast-paced aspect of entertainment, not just within the entertainment, but the problem is with outside it, outside the entertainment. So we are getting our minds trained to expect. You know what it's like? You're on Facebook, flip, 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 click, uh, flip, flip, flip. Like you are just moving, baby, just going through these things, just, but you're not satisfied. You're very distracted. And this, so it can create in us this distracted nature that takes us away from the most important thing of being a Christian. Like we are to be people who are given ourselves totally to God. Listen to this, Psalm 46.10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Psalm 37.7. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way. Over the man who carries out evil desires. The Christian life is a, dare I say it, contemplative life. It is a life that has to be, has to be removed from distraction. It is one to be, that we sit still, that we meditate upon the word of God, that we meditate upon the very nature of God. And by our meditation, we understand that God will be exalted. God will be high and lifted up. And our sanctification and our conformancy to, the, to God comes through our resting and contemplating the word of God. And when we are giving ourselves to entertainment, we can be very distracted by it. So while it is a blessing given for our rest, it can be a great distraction to take us away from our life in Christ from getting our minds set on God. Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And the only way you're going to renew your mind is by being in the word of God, by abiding in Christ. And the transforming life of a Christian comes through renewing our mind in Christ. And so when we come to the Christian life and read in the word, right, what we want is we want quick, Lord, you've got to give me this. You know, I can't do these, these three chapters. That's just too long for me. Maybe give me a quick devotional. 
You know, just give me the verse, give me a quick hit, and I'll read that and I'm done. Because that's the nature of the way entertainment has trained us. And therefore, we become distracted in the Christian life. And we can't sit still and contemplate God. And so, first danger, it can become a distraction for us when we are called to give ourselves to Christ, to our family, and to our church. So the question is, is my entertainment distracting me away from renewing my mind in Christ? Because that is a great danger. The second danger we have is that, is it an idol? Is my entertainment an idol to me? So do I go to entertainment instead of going to God? Is my entertainment a replacement for God? What do I mean by this? When entertainment becomes an escape from guilt of sin, troubles in relationship, anxiety from work, then it's taken the place of God. Entertainment is no longer rest, it is God. If I'm having to find my peace in my entertainment, my escape in my entertainment, to remove my anxiety in my entertainment, my entertainment becomes the very thing that God should be. And it's become my idol. And that becomes an immense danger. If I'm fleeing to entertainment for my um, satisfaction and not God, then entertainment has taken the place of God. A French uh, sociologist, Jacques Ellul, made this observation with regards to the danger that accompanies TV, TV and film. He said, People go to the movies to escape and consequently yield to its pressures. They find forgetfulness and in forgetfulness the honeyed freedom they do not find in their work or at home. They live on the screen a life they will never live in fact. When entertainment becomes my escape, entertainment has become my God. And that could be a computer game. I mean, I just need to de-stress. I, I've, I'm so stressed right now. I just need to go to here. Do you know what happens? As soon as you finish, it's not de-stressed you. you you've got to, it's like a drug. You've got to go back for more. Because when we rest in God, God has taken care of all things. We can rest in Him. And we, and we can then use entertainment as a way of enjoying it for what it is. If this is the place where my nerves are steadied, my fears pacified, and comfort is found, then it has become my master. And Jesus has something to say about this. Matthew 6, 24, he says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God or money. Now, just understand, this is, yes, it's talking about God or money, the two, and we're not talking necessarily about entertainment, but the whole concept is the same. Either you're going to serve Christ or you're going to serve something else. If you're serving something else, you're not serving Christ. And when entertainment becomes that very thing, we become addicted to it, it becomes our idol, it will never satisfy the very thing that Christ can do, and entertainment will do that for us, and then it will ultimately enslave us. And we become enslaved or addicted to entertainment. And it ultimately cannot give us the happiness we need. And this is what happened to Israel as they, were, um, as they were seeking after other things than God. Jeremiah 2.13 For my people, God says, have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. The whole point is they were trying to res um, uh, receive refreshment for life from dirty cisterns, from anything other than God. And God says, you've hewed out dirty systems. It's not going to relieve your pain. It's not going to re refresh your um, life. And he says, come back to me. And Jesus says the same thing to us. Either you're going to serve him or you're going to serve something else. And Jesus says, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and I will make your burdens light. Jesus is the only one who can ultimately give us the fulfillment we need and the rest we have. He becomes our sanctification. So the first question is, is my entertainment distracting me away from renewing my mind in God? Secondly, do I need entertainment instead of needing God? Do I go to that instead of God? 
What about the third one? Let's have a look at another distraction or a danger, I should say. And that is worldliness. Is my entertainment honoring to God? Now, we know that entertainment, most of all, is produced by those who hate God, those who are opposed to God. Um, And therefore, it's going to come with its own message, it's going to become with its own morality, and it will glorify that which it upholds. And so often, it's not going to be the things that you love or I love. It's not going to be the things of God. It's going to be the things of ultimately Satan. And the thing is, when we do this, when we partake in this, we become like it. James 4.4, 4, it says, You adulterous people, do, not, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend with the world makes himself an enemy of God. James is stating an important fact. You delight in the world, you become an enemy of God. You delight in the things that that the world loves through the entertainment, you become an enemy of God. If our entertainment in any way is dishonoring to God and the word of God, the morals of God, the ethics of God, the character of God, we are doing something that the world loves and we become worldly in our thinking and we begin to dishonor God. We are members of Christ's body. We're his bride. We are not to give ourselves over to another. And so when we take on entertainment that is dishonoring to God, we are giving ourselves to other lovers than our prime lover, and that is Christ. And we are committing spiritual idolatry or adultery. Are you enjoying entertainment that dishonors God? And you might say, but it's no big deal. I can deal with this. It's okay. Uh, We become worldly and we become an enemy of God. And as James himself says, Psalm 101, 3, I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. Distractions, idols, worldliness. But also one thing also it does produce in us is a consumer mentality. Is entertainment causing me to develop a consumer mentality? We know that entertainment is self-serving. We only do entertainment because it serves us. We enjoy it. We're not going to do something that we don't like, are we? I'm not going to go and watch, what would I not like? I don't, anyway, I won't, I, something I'm not going to enjoy. We're going to, it's self-serving. Now, what happens is we are, Choosing entertainment to serve ourselves, what happens is we become consumers of all things other than all things else, including entertainment. We become, we have this consumer mentality, and that consumer mentality can be taken into the church. So we become very um, critical. Just as we uh, criticize uh, entertainment, we can become very critical of the things in the church. Love when Jesus rebukes the Jewish leaders in Matthew 11. I'll read it 16 to 19. He says, But to you, sorry, but to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. Now that's like a a wedding. We played the flute. It's a happy thing. You did not dance. We sang the dirge. And you did not mourn, meaning that's what you're doing at funerals. Quite polar opposites. And he looks at the polar opposites with him and John. He says, For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The opposite to that, the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look at him, a glutton and a, and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. This disgruntled children of this generation were willing to whine and criticize the message of John and the polar message of Christ. They became consumers of religion and they rejected the truth because they were whining about the way the truth was given. Whether it was uh, John who gave up the aspects of life for the sake of Christ, whether it was Jesus who was open 
not to necessarily fast and do other things. And they said, we reject both. They became consumers of religion and, and, and missed the very religion that they thought they were trying to gain. And so we, as we are consumers of entertainment, we will become consumers of religion. Do you hop around at different churches? Uh, do you come and criticize the message? Do you come and criticize the music constantly? Is entertainment playing into that? Are you becoming a critique of all good things of God? Different because you've, been, um, you've, you've, you've become a critique of entertainment. Let me quote this with regards to this, um, these verses. This is a, this is a quote uh, given by a commentator. But all you do, as Jesus is speaking, but all you do is give orders and criticize. For you, John, is a madman, Jesus, and, uh, because he fasts. Well, you want to be entertained, me you reject, with scorn because I eat with publicans, while you insist on strict separation from sinners. You hate the preaching of repentance and you hate the proclamation of the gospel. So you play your childish games with God's message while Rome burns. Are you becoming a consumer of Christianity because you're a consumer of entertainment? And don't miss this. He's using the concept of children. Such immature uh, people, the religious leaders, making a distinction between John and Jesus and missing both of their messages because they were consumers of religion and they were not close to God. So we have four questions there. They are, and there's probably many, dangers that we face as we're trying to navigate how are we to live as Christians in this Christ dishonoring world and also use entertainment as an aspect of rest are any of those applicable to you now let's have a look at six principles that i believe will help guide us when we look at entertainment now the first is obvious and the first is potentially all capsulating as i think of the entertainment i'm about to look at or i'm about to participate the question i must ask is will it glorify god Paul says in 1 Corinthians uh, 10.31, so whether you drink, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Does it glorify God or will it glorify God? And in the negative, in other words, does it violate God's word in any way? Does it violate God's word? Ephesians 5, 11, 12, Paul says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of these things that they do in secret. Are you being entertained by things that Christ died for or that put Christ on the cross for? Are you enjoying the very things that God hates? They're actually not glorifying God, they are opposed to God. And in the positive, so do, does it violate what God says? Because it will not glorify God. And the other question is, does it honor God? Does it honor God? And this is the greatest test. If I'm engaging in any activity that is not glorifying God, then it is ultimately, as a Christian, unlawful for us to participate in. If it does not glorify God, and if it does, then you are free to participate. Enjoy. That becomes your rest. But if it's not glorifying to God, if it's dishonoring to God, you have no right to view it and participate in it. It is unlawful to you. And you might think, well, that's pretty tough, isn't it? I've told you the dangers. See, we, we think that the boundaries are set for us to, because God's a stingy God. God's not a stingy God. God has set blessings upon our life at, by the law of God to direct our life. It is a blessing. Because he knows what we need. He knows what is best suited to us. And he provides all that is necessary to walk a God-glorifying life. So that's, I believe, the first principle we have. The second, will it cause someone else to sin? Will it cause someone else to sin? Will it cause, in Paul's words, my brother to stumble? And Paul uses this in 1 Corinthians 8 uh, 7 to 13, I won't read the whole lot of it. 
but it's basically saying that, that meat given to idols, um, and if I eat meat given to idols, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. Um, because ultimately idols are nothing. But if I find that someone says that meat given to idols is wrong or, or his conscience is moved against doing that, and he says, I don't feel comfortable, and if I then go ahead and eat that meat that is being given to idols and say, look, don't worry about it. Don't stress. Christ died. It's nothing. The idol's nothing. It's useless. It's not actually real. What I'm doing, I'm causing my brother to go down a road that could cause him to sin. I'm going against his own conscience as I'm leading him astray. And so Paul says that when we look at our entertainment, it's not just us we've got to think about. It's the effect that this will have on my children, on my neighbours, on my people, the people in my church. I'm not my own. And therefore, I've got to I live by example before others and I've got to take that into consideration as I'm living before others. Will that which I'm being entertained in caused my brother to be led away because he struggles with this. I might be quite free. I might, my conscience might be absolutely clear. I feel totally at ease to go and enjoy this. Nothing inherently wrong with it, but my brother struggles with this for whatever reason. Therefore, I am to leave it off. I am not to be entertained by that. So here's another principle. Third one, will it lead people away from Christ? We're thinking of unbelievers now. Also in Corinthians, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 23 to 24, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. And it sort of goes along the same lines as we were talking about before. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Now, it's not necessarily talking about a a, a Christian there. It's talking about a non-Christian. So if by my doing this, it actually leads people away from Christ and not to Christ, again, Paul says, I will not do it because my whole life is evangelistic. My whole life is orientated towards bringing people to Christ and not away from Christ. So now it limits again what I will entertain myself with because I have a greater desire for them to come to Christ than for me to be entertained. Another principle. Oops, another principle here. Will it distract from opportunities? What does this mean? Will it distract from opportunities? And I think this is a big one. Ephesians 5, 15 to 16. He says, Paul again, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of your time. Now, the word time here does not mean uh, the chronological time making the best use of my time. Okay, I've got an hour. I want to make the use of that. Entertainment might not do that. That's not what it's talking about. It's more the opportunities that come in time. Make the best use of opportunities. And so as I'm considering, you know what? I've had a hard day. I just want to leave everything and I just want to sit down and watch the footy. As an example, the opportunity might be actually against that, meaning that say... We're together as a family. And I have an opportunity to have dinner as a family. I think that is the best opportunity right now for the glory of God. And I'll cease from from my entertainment and I'll wait. Or it could be a different opportunity. This is time with my wife. Uh, This is time that a friend has come over. Um, It's a time that God is convicting me to repent of a sin and it just would not be right for me to now take that burden and almost escape from that burden and go and entertain myself rather than deal with the sin nature. And he's saying, and I think that it will, um, does it distract us from opportunities that come our way to give to others or to make something right within myself? Therefore, I should do those things, cease from that and give myself to that opportunity. The next thing, another principle. Will it enslave me? And we just, we talked about this before. Remember, if we are using entertainment as an escape rather than going to God for those things, then we will be enslaved by it. So I won't go into that in any more detail, but is my entertainment enslaving me? You know, like the game you've got on your, um, on your iPhone and it's like, I've got a man, 
you know, because it demands me to upgrade or every hour or something and I get some more coins. I, I've tried one of those. They're killers. <laughs> Wipe it. Get rid of it. Seriously. <laughs> they enslave you very quickly. Get rid of it. It's enslaving me. Um, you know, got some stress on. Let me just go into this and take, take the stress away. It's, it's enslaving me. And the principle being, do you entertain yourself to seek escape from that which God can provide for. The last one here. Does it violate my conscience? Does it violate my conscience? Romans 14.23 But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. If my conscience is troubled by the entertainment I potentially will, will view or, or be participants in it. I should not do it. If in, if in doubt, leave it out. Because my conscience is troubled. And, and Paul says, do not sin against your conscience. Martin Luther said, I cannot and will not recant anything. For to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand, I can do no other. So help me God. We are never to go against our conscience. If our conscience is causing us to say this, I just don't feel comfortable with this, we're to leave it off and seek entertainment that does honour God, that leaves my conscience clean and clear, that doesn't take away from opportunities, doesn't enslave, doesn't distract. So guys, what I've tried to show you tonight is that we live in an entertainment-saturated world. We are bombarded every moment of every day. And I'm sure in some ways uh, we are, are falling down in many of these areas. My aim is to bring a focus on it and to provide you guiding principles to help you to enjoy the entertainment that God has given us. I, I don't think to feel guilty in enjoying entertainment, but at the same time, don't let that lack of guilt uh, lead you to an openness to accept anything. God wants us to be holy as he is holy. God wants us to honor him in every way and remembering that my life is a representation of Christ and I am to be a light to this darkened world and I am to have an influence over other people and I will do that through my entertainment. I am not an autonomous person. I am a child of God. You are a child of God if you're in him and we need, entertain, we need to entertain ourselves with those things that Christ loves that Christ honours, and that is then free ultimately for us to enjoy. And we should not feel necessarily guilty on that. So let me pray and ask Andrew to come up. And if you have any questions, we have about 10 minutes, we can deal with those things. Dear Lord, I do pray uh, that we would take this very seriously. Lord, we do want to be children of God that honours you. Lord, you've put stipulations in place in our life. Uh, Lord, not to make our life... Um, a, a la to have a lack of joy, to be so disconnected to the world. But Lord, you've given us these things to cause us to have deep delight, not enslavement to sin, but freedom from sin. And Lord, entertainment is one of those things that we can easily find ourselves enslaved to, distracted by, uh, reliant upon, uh, rather than you, Lord. I pray that you would help us to be wise in the way we deal with entertainment. Enjoy it when we can, having worked hard and now rested. Uh, Lord, guide us with these things. We need your help in Jesus' name. Amen.